Let's give him a hand. <laughs> All right, welcome to this, uh, this recital lecture that I'm giving on John Coltrane. In this lecture recital, I will examine John Coltrane's melodic, harmonic, and thematic content in his saxophone solos over a span of 14 years between 1951 and 1965. During this time, the composition impressions evolved into becoming one of, the, one of Coltrane's main vehicles of expression. I'll examine other compositions that Col Coltrane played and studied earlier for the purpose of explaining how impressions came into existence. The purpose is to conduct in-depth studies so that we can, uh, we can get a panoramic view of Coltrane's evolution from being a sideman to becoming one of the monumental innovators of jazz. I'll start by examining Coltrane's teachers, his musical influences, and the musicians he played with. Then I analyze Coltrane's solo on So Wet from when he was a sideman with Miles Davis, and then I'll move on to impressions from the Newport 63 album. Then finally, I'll conclude my analysis by examining his soloing on impressions from the album Live in Paris from 1965. Now, the solos on Newport 63 and Live in Paris are quite long, actually the 14 minutes and 16 minutes, uh, respectively. I'll focus on analyzing the areas of his solos where he makes clear deviations from the previous recordings as he kept growing and expressing himself. His dedication to learning about music, astronomy, and philosophy added a deeper pool of information that eventually opened his point of view when he created music. His affinity for the intellect of Albert Einstein, Charlie Parker, Igor Stravinsky, combined with his quest for spiritual peace added to his ever-expanding body of music. These are the reasons his language on the saxophone, saxophone kept expanding. You, know, you can listen to a recording from you know, 19, 55, it sounds like one train, you, then you listen to him in 65, it sounds like a whole another train. I mean, like, there are clear advancements, so I want to outline and talk about those. Also, in this analysis, I'll list the different band members, the stylistic characteristics of each one, and how they played, and how they supported soloists, and how, and how they played as a trio. The purpose is to analyze these musicians so that we can get a better understanding of why Coltrane went into the areas that he chose and how doing so made his music that much more unique. Lastly, I'll list the current events from the 1950s through the 1960s which affected Coltrane's music. This level of analysis is, is important because in order to thoroughly understand Coltrane's music, one must analyze these different areas for they are the stimuli which fed inspiration to one of the greatest musicians of the 20th century. And when I, I as I took classes here at uh, USC, I studied uh, theory, post-tonal theory, with a guy named Bob Moore, Professor Bob Moore. And he's a brilliant, brilliant man. He always related what was going on socially and society to the music because the two are so intertwined. And just as a uh, author's note, the solo transcriptions that I'll be uh, uh, using will all be in the transpose key of B flat. So. Whenever I speak about the saxophone solos, B flat. Whenever I speak about the composition, I'll speak of it in the concert key. John Coltrane, well, who is he? I mean, we know who Coltrane is, but there was a, a trajectory that he traveled on. He was born in 1926, September 23rd, in Hamlet, North Carolina, and he was raised in High Point, North Carolina. In 1943, his family moved to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. During that same year, while in high school, his mother bought him a saxophone, and he joined a community band. John Coltrane enlisted in the Navy on August 6th, 1945. And while Coltrane was in the Navy, he joined a swing band called the Melody Masters. The band also featured a trumpet player and composer that he did work with later on. His name is William Cal Massey. They would go on to experiment with different ideas. Of course, they played bebop and they played, you know, the, the, the traditional repertoire, but they were also mixing uh, different styles, different types of music from around the world with jazz to create new sounds. After being discharged from his duties in the Navy, Coltrane returned to Philadelphia. It was in Philly where Coltrane entered a new scene of new music, bebop, and advanced harmonic study. He studied jazz theory with the guitarist and composer Dennis Sandoli from 1946 through the 1950s. 
Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie are two of the main progenitors of bebop, and they are part of the nucleus of modern jazz. Their music directly influenced John Coltrane and Miles Davis. In particular, Dizzy Gillespie's style of improvisation was highly influential. His style was at its peak during the 1940s and 50s, and Coltrane played with him from 1949 to 1951. Dizzy's style is characterized by fast technique, a style which Coltrane adopted later. Dizzy often played with a maximum output of 16th and 32nd notes at a high velocity. Dizzy Gillespie's style was also a main ingredient for John Coltrane's sheets of sound, but because of the percussive and brash sound of the trumpet, that connection has been overlooked. And I'm gonna play you some things that you're gonna actually hear that. On the recording, uh, Train's First Ride from 1951, John Coltrane with Dizzy Gillespie live at Birdland. Coltrane sounds like an extension of Dexter Gordon more than Charlie Parker. In the early 1950s, while Coltrane played with Dizzy Gillespie, his rhythmic concept was based in eighth notes and eighth note triplets. This Dizzy Gillespie recording features short moments when Coltrane does play 16th note phrases but the more sheets of sound style, which has become synonymous with Coltrane's playing, developed later during his affiliation with Miles Davis. The, the six years between playing with Dizzy Gillespie and playing with Miles Davis were enough time for Coltrane to really internalize Dizzy's soloing concept. So now we're gonna take a listen to how he played when he was with Dizzy Gillespie. Sounds different, right? We'd just say it sounds like Dexter, right? Yeah, yeah, he's just laying in the pocket, right? <laughs> well, here's an important uh, thing to consider. Miles Davis left Juilliard because he wanted to play bebop at the clubs in New York City. He was inspired by the modern jazz sounds that were being created by Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie, among others. After Dizzy departed from Charlie Parker's quintet, Bird asked Miles to join his band. He obliged but it was evident that he did not have flawless technique like Dizzy Gillespie. Miles played Dizzy Gillespie's composition of Night in Tunisia regularly while he was a member of Bird's band. So he heard that high energy, harmonically intense, and complex composition night after night. And we have to remember something that when we listen, at least I'll speak for myself, when I listen to a, a lot of these compositions now, it's, it's like, okay, I hear it, right? But it's like, if I put it in context, of what else was being played at the time, what was on pop radio, what was being played on jazz radio. And when you hear it next to that, then you can hear how modern it really was at the time. Um, so that's just something to consider. I, once I heard uh, uh, one of the uh, Norman Grand's uh, jazz, the Philharmonic uh, recordings, and it was Bird and Lester Young. And I had been listening to a lot of Bird up until that point, but when I heard him next to Lester Young, then I truly got Bird. And when I hear, and then, and then also when the audience did not clap after Bird like they did after Lester Young, then I really got it. <laughs> it was like, okay, he was really advanced and they didn't really quite get it. So, um, so he's playing this composition night after night. And during this time, he also ha has to find his own voice while he's trying to fill the trumpet chair of Dizzy Gillespie. And you know, as artists, if we're lucky and honest with ourselves as humans, we all realize that we have to look within to find our own voice, which will speak to who we are 
as artists. I believe that Miles Davis did the same thing, and eventually his own trumpet sound and compositional style emerged. Miles Davis left Charlie Parker's band in 1948. John Coltrane joined Dizzy's band in 1949. As Miles developed his cool, laid-back style, he needed a saxophonist who contrasted his style and who could deliver bebop lines with the same intensity as Charlie Parker and, Ma and Dizzy Gillespie. Excuse me. He found these characteristics in John Coltrane. This is why I stated that Dizzy may have also influenced Coltrane to develop his sheets of sound style. During the bebop of the 1950s, this was just a modern jazz way of thinking and playing music. Let's go on to the musicians. In order to understand the journey which Coltrane traveled, we must understand that what was happening with the different styles of, of jazz and, and the way they played, that he was a part, also a part of. Along with a particular school of musicians came a specific style of voicing chords, certain approaches to soloing, and a certain style that rhythm section players played with behind the soloist. The musicians, uh, I'm going to talk about Dizzy's band now. The musicians that are featured on Train's First Ride were a group of talented young musicians who at the time were what I call transitional bebop cats. They weren't the original bebop cats. They weren't Kenny Clark, Thelonious Monk, uh, those guys. These guys were the next guys, the young guys that were learning with the older musicians. And I call them transitional because their shining moment was really when hard, the first uh, phase of hard bop happened from 1955 to 58. The musicians I'm talking about are John Coltrane, Milt Jackson, Billy Taylor, Percy Heath, Art Blakey, J.J. Johnson, and John Lewis. They became very big names after they left at Dizzy Gillespie's band. Harmonically, these men played in the style of pure bebop while they were in Dizzy's band. This pure type of bebop was developed in Harlem at Minton's Playhouse. Harmonically, the chord structures were an extension of black American blues and European harmonies. The minor chords tended to be what I call real minor chords. Minor triads, minor six chords, minor six nine chords, and at most minor seven chords. It is important for me to define the voicings because Coltrane soloed within those harmo harmonic confinements. The chords stacked in fourths came later with the release of Kind of Blue. So you have guys limiting how they're approaching the, the harmony, and the soloists are in turn limiting how they're approaching it. As a companist, the rhythm section players played time comping with the com within the confines of where the solo was headed, but also staying within the harmonic structure of the song's form. There was minimal room for chord substitutions because the compositions were already complex. The bebop compositions of Thelonious Monk, Charlie Parker, and Dizzy Gillespie were difficult enough, and the rhythm section musicians comp behind each soloist while staying within the tonal and rhythmic framework of those compositions. These rhythm section players did not push the performance outside of the song's form and character. Rather, they improved the arrangement by adding shout choruses, send-offs, and backgrounds, but with raw New York City energy. Harmonic and rhythmic freedom came later during the early to mid 60s with John Coltrane's quartet leading the way. Okay, now we're going to play a 19 as has a band. If I could get my band members up.
All right, so now we're going to talk about uh, his harmonic influences. Now, I put it up in the cosmos because he was also studying astronomy at the same time. So don't be uh, thrown off by that. But, <laughs> but it is kind of cool seeing a monk's face in the, in the cosmos. Okay, here we have three people that were highly influential on Coltrane in terms of how they approached harmony and theoretical concepts. Thelonious Monk at the top, pianist and composer, Coltrane said that he learned more about complex chord changes and melodies from playing with Monk more than anyone else. And um, you know, with Monk, Monk didn't write any of his music out. And if you check out his music, extremely complex rhythmically and harmonically, but he had to remember everything. And uh, not to get in any debates, but his music is, is quite complex. And if you compare it to other people that Train played with at the time, I can see why he said that. Now, down, down on the second, uh, this gentleman right here, this is Dennis Sandoli, composer and music theory teacher who taught Coltrane in the 1940s through the early 1950s. He had a very formal style of teaching music, and uh, he taught out of uh, Philadelphia. And it is uh, known that Coltrane studied with him double time. And when I mean double time, I say that he had a program where you would come to music lessons once per week over the course of about eight years. And Coltrane finished it in four years. He took two lessons per week. So he was extremely uh, motivated to learn and to study. And he learned his whole system in four years. This last gentleman in the corner with Max Roach is a pianist named Hassan Ibn Ali. He's a pianist and a music theorist. And according to Max Roach's former saxophonist, Odine Pope, who's actually from Philly, he studied, uh, Coltrane studied with the pianist, composer, and theorist Hassan Ibn Ali. And uh, Pope credits Ibn Ali with influencing Coltrane's sheets of sound approach as well. He says um, Ibn Ali really was uh, going into the area of playing different intervals, intervals between chords. So of course in, in jazz and in Western harmony we have the fifth is the dominant interval of root motion. So his idea was why don't we try seconds? Why don't we try thirds? So he brought that to Coltrane and that eventually led to Giant Steps and Countdown. The way the, the root motion moves in, in the, you know, the core, I'm sorry, the uh, key centers move in thirds, major thirds, instead of fifths. So I thought that was interesting when I found that out. Kind of thought Coltrane did that all by himself. I mean, he's, you know, he's a great, great saxophonist. But I'm doing this also to explain how there are different people who influenced Coltrane along the way. Also, uh, Odin Pope said that he was really into, uh, Ibn Ali was into teaching Coltrane how to stack chords against the chord. So there'd be situations where you'd have a, a, a tonal center, say F minor, and then he would stack F major, G major, and A flat major against F minor to give him more possibilities. And it's, it's known that McCoy Tyner studied with this gentleman as well. Pretty much every musician out of Philly that was modern was studying with this guy. Okay. Okay, Charles Ives' composition, The Cage, which was written in 1903, is written using quartal harmony. And when I say quartal, I mean in four, four, court, meaning four. The voicing which uh, became synonymous with Coltrane. What's different about McCoy Tyner's approach to quartal harmony is that he played the chords with power like Charles Ives did, which is a different approach than Bill Evans. Bill Evans was more subdued, more laid back. Now I'm gonna play the, uh, the song, The Cage by Charles Ives.
That's pretty hip, right? That was 1903. <laughs> Charles Ives was on it. <laughs> and you know, what's interesting about Charles Ives, he, um, he developed one of the largest insurance conglomerates uh, in, in the country. So, you know, he was able to go home and just create what he wanted. <laughs> so he didn't have to stay within the, what, you know, the music scene expected him to do or the composers, you know, guild or anything like that. I, I fell out when I first heard that. I was knocked out. I was like, 1903? <laughs> yeah, okay, so, um, okay, so I'm gonna explain these musicians here. Of course, we know that's Miles Davis in the top left. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm also focusing on this, uh, this slide because I want everyone to really get an idea of how these musicians were trading concepts and they were talking to each other, you know, like we do today. I know sometimes for me, I, when I study these older musicians, these greats, I kind of single them out, you know, whether by default or whatever, because I wasn't there. And so I just see a photo, like I see Miles Davis, and I say, oh, Miles Davis. But, you know, Miles Davis was talking to Bill Evans and Gil Evans. You see Miles peeking over Gil Evans' shoulder, checking out his voicings. And we know how great Gil Evans was. Everyone knows who Gil Evans uh, was, the arranger for Poor Game Bass and all those great albums. So he says, hey, hey, Gil, what you got going on there, man? I like that sound. Was that euphonium and clarinet? Okay, cool, that sounds good. <laughs> See the bottom left there, Train is talking to Bill Evans. Man, so what are you playing on that right there, man? <laughs> I'm playing the force. That's him. They're talking, you know, uh, they're talking to each other and they're trying things out, they're experimenting it and they find these different areas, you know. And like we do musicians, we go home and we, we try it out. We say, well, let me see what he was talking about. Bam, you know, oh, what could I play over that? And then, you know, Miles goes back to Bill Evans and says, hey man, I think that's cool, but what if you tried it like this? Okay, I never thought about that. So, you know, this is, a, this is a music of evolution, and especially when we talk about Coltrane, it's an evolution that he went through. Very much like science, you know, what we do as musicians, but especially him, the way he was just so on top of different, different ideas and, and studying with people and being humble and trying to learn more, learning from the different teachers that he had, but also, you know, trying different things out that, you know, other musicians were doing. And also, sometimes the musicians would try something, and maybe he would change it and make it a little different and then that's why we like Coltrane because he had a different way of approaching things. Now I'm gonna play Coltrane solo and I want you to think about some of these ideas that I have up here. On this recording he's really sticking to E Dorian and E Jazz melodic minor. You have to remember that Miles Davis brought this composition in and, and no one knew what it was before he brought it in. Now this is an important point because Coltrane goes to the composition and those two areas that he's playing off of, E Dorian and E Jazz Melodic Minor, that's what you use on uh, A Night in Tunisia. So I'm saying that to say that this, what we know of Coltrane playing impressions has a lot of Night in Tunisia, oh, I'm sorry, uh, on So What has a lot of Night in Tunisia in it in terms of how they approach the soloing. Not in the voicings. So it's easy to, for it to fly right by you and say, oh, those are fourth chords. But if, after transcribing Coltrane's solo, I can see that he was right around this area. He was in Dorian, jazz melodic. But he's playing so fast and he's moving the rhythms around that it could fly right by you because now he's stepping outside. And the other thing is that he just finished recording Giant Steps, same year. So he's going in on Giant Steps. Then he gets to So What, and it's laid back. And now what Miles is doing, he's combining cool jazz that he played out here on the, on the West Coast with the East Coast sound. So he's laying back on it. And I, that was something I realized. A, a lot of times people don't think of, of So What as having any strains of cool jazz, but it actually really does if you look at how relaxed they're playing. Because if you listen to, um, if you listen to, uh, the other album that he put out that year, da, 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 da. they're playing much more New York style, aggressive, playing hardcore bebop, hard bop rhythms. Now they cooled it out with So What. Now he's starting to use Ibn Ali's ideas about stacking chords, 
There are the ideas, the extensions. Think of it like this. The um, stacking chords concept is basically taking the roots from F minor Dorian and then ex changing the chord qualities above that. So all those roots are still within that scale. So it's still related, it's not random. And then he's going for 16 notes and I feel like this is where the Dizzy Gillespie influence really started to come about and we start to hear that flawless technique and just hardcore saxophone playing. All right, now we're going to play uh, So What? And we're going to stick to the characteristics of the composition. Like I said, staying in Dorian, E Dorian, and F uh, minor Dorian, but not really going too far out. And, and just try to think about how the musicians who were playing with him, what context they were at the time. They were coming out of bebop. The, the harmonic confinements were fixed. Um, they weren't breaking up things yet.
Let's talk about a night in Tunisia for a minute. <clears throat> the influence of a night in Tunisia on so what on so what is similar to how George Gershwin's "I've Got Rhythm" became one of the important song forms in jazz, and how everyone that was considered to be a real jazz musician either had to solo effortless, effort, uh, excuse me, effortlessly. My embouchure is getting in the way. <laughs> effortlessly by playing rhythm changes, or they had to compose a song based on the same set of chord changes. And even though rhythm changes has its original set of chord changes, its har harmonic form has sometimes been altered. Case in point, Sonny Stitt's etern Eternal Triangle. It's rhythm changes, but then that bridge goes to the, the tritone dominant chord. So I think, I think, I think what's going on, uh, w at least what I see, is that a lot of times people don't think uh, of a night in Tunisia as being related. But what I'm trying to say is that they were playing night in Tunisia every night, every night, every night, playing through the form. And you know, at, after a certain point, I think Miles Davis probably felt like, you know what, Dizzy's dizzy, I'm Miles. I gotta figure out a way to do this a little differently, you know? Now, a night in Tunisia consists of both tonal harmony and modality. The tiny key is obviously D minor concert, and the transpose key of B flat, the first chord is F7, that is the sub five seven of E minor. This F7, the sub five seven of E contains a C natural, the flat six of the key. This sub five seven is an advanced reharmonization which is based in tonal harmony. The tonic chord is sometimes played as an E minor triad or as an E minor six nine chord. The E minor six nine chord hints at the E minor Dorian mode because the chord's natural six scale, scale degree is a C sharp. So in the second bar, the soloist can play an E minor chord scale with a flat six over an E minor triad or an E minor Dorian scale with an E minor sixth chord. So you can go either way with it. So it's right on the cusp of a change of thought, a change of composition, and uh, uh, essentially just looking at harmony and uh, theory in a different way, in a, moda in a modal way. As I'll point out later, Coltrane's, uh, Coltrane played both a C and a C sharp during his solo on So What, he was transitioning into modality at the time he recorded with Miles Davis because the composition was brought into the studio and played for the first time on the spot. So no one had time to get anything to go together. And I think that maybe Miles Davis knew that he was recording Giant Steps and he was going shedding really hard and probably said, you know what, I'm throwing something at them they don't even know what it's gonna be. And let's just see what happens, you know, musically. It was still a new concept. After Coltrane felt more comfortable with the modal concept, he eventually moved on to bimodality, that's playing two modes at once, simultaneously. Polymodi uh, polymodality, which is playing two or more modes at the same time, and eventually chromaticism over modality. So he's starting to stack modes, play in between them, and then he's using chromaticism now you can call that you can call the bimodality or or polymodality as being chromatic in terms of how you analyze it, but modally speaking, he was stacking two modes on each other and playing off of the two at the same time. In essence, Miles Davis's "So What" is an extension of Dizzy Gillespie's "A Night in Tunisia." John Coltrane's "Impressions" is an extension of "So What" and Morton Gould's "Pavan." They are all connected, either by compositional constructs or by melodic, harmonic, and thematic content of each artist's solo. Now, um, just to talk about So What a little bit, to give some background, when Miles Davis composed So What, he was trying to go for, uh, he modeled it after the field hollers in the Deep South, when the workers would work in the field, and there'd be a call and response. So one worker would sing a call, and then the other workers would sing back the response. So the call is given to the bass, and the response is the full band responding to the bass's melody. So th that's the, the, the inspiration for, um, for So What. Now, <coughs> So What really deviated from what compositions were doing at that time. Most compositions during that time would have a set of chord changes that the rhythm section would play, and then there would be kicks, hits within that rhythm section, uh, chart, and then the melody would be played by a monophonic instrument. That was pretty much what was going on. You'd have big band style hits. So So What 
kind of turned that on its side and said, no, we're not going to do that. We're not going to just go through a set of chord changes while we're playing melody. Now we're going to bring it to the bass, let him play something, and we react to it. And I think that's one of the reasons why that composition kind of shifted music, along with these other ideas. But I think that was a central element. Also in Mr. Davis's autobiography, he states how Ahmad Jamal was highly influential on his music, ultimately shaping the way he approached soloing and writing. This tells us that there was a clear exchange between Ahmad Jamal and Miles Davis. Mr. Davis's treatment of melody, chord progressions, and small group arranging had become more simplified after his time spent in uh, the bebop ensemble of Charlie Parker and after his explorations into West Coast cool jazz. So I think he wanted to kind of cool things out. You know, you're in New York, it's, it's quite busy, quite frantic. The music is a reflection of that. He came out to the West Coast, he played you know, the, the, the nine piece groups and they play these West Coast jazz arrangements. You, you know, they're out by the water, it's cooled out, it's nice, it's relaxing. And I think he brought that out in his music, that was his intention, and it, and it came out. Okay, now we're gonna move on to John Coltrane's quartet. So you see where I'm going. I started with the night in Tunisia. Those two gentlemen, Miles Davis and, and John Coltrane, were in Dizzy and Charlie Parker's bands. They're hearing their music. They go off on their own. They're influenced by them, but they're starting to move in other directions. McCoy Tyner's playing was perfect for John Coltrane. Technically and harmonically, he was an extension of Bud Powell and Hassan Ibn Ali. Coltrane's time spent playing with Bill Evans in Miles Davis's band allowed Coltrane to hear post-tonal characteristics of Charles Ives and Alexander Scriabin. So by the way of Coltrane, Bill Evans became an influence on McCoy Tyner's voice, piano voicings. By the time Impressions Live at the Newport Jazz Festival 1963 was released, Mr. Tyner had been fusing his hard bop jazz style with Bill Evans' piano voicings, stacked them fourths along with Coltrane's harmonic concepts. This was, a, this was a harmonically dense period for Coltrane and it was all structured. Prior to his work with Coltrane, McCoy Tyner was a pianist in Benny Golson and Art Farmer's co-led group, the Jazz Tet. Then he was a tonal bebop pianist with a swinging light touch. So then when he gets, to, when he gets around Coltrane, he starts to open it up a little bit. He's opening the voicings up, and what happens is Coltrane is obviously telling him, hey, try this like that, don't play triadic. And so they're moving away from a night in Tunisia. Mr. Tyner's growth and development was partly due to the freedom which, he, which he was granted by John Coltrane. This freedom allowed Mr. Tyner to explore the music both rhythmically and harmonically. These experimentations all led to what jazz critics and jazz historians oft often refer to as the new thing, the new sound that was coming out. Jimmy Garrison created new ways of playing the acoustic bass. He strummed and struck the bass during long solo cadenzas and he broke up the beat by playing pedal points. So they're starting to move away from Jimmy Blanton's style of four, four quarter notes. Fresh out of Ornette Coleman's band, he offered an alternative to the quarter note swing. In addition, Mr. Garrison played with a rhythmic pulse which laid right in the center of the quarter note beat while Mr. Jones layered the 4-4 beat with various 12-8 polyrhythms. As cutting edge as this group was, Mr. Garrison was also preserved the tradition of the past by holding a steady quarter note pulse when it was needed. Mathematically, Elvin Jones' quarter note pulse lay just behind the beat of Mr. Garrison and McCoy Tyner was just ahead. So you had this, this, these three men who looked at rhythm in a different way, but yet they were united and they were moving as one. So it's interesting uh, the way they interpreted time. It was a little different, but that's what makes Coltrane's group sound like it does. Elvin Jones and Roy Haynes. To really understand completely why Coltrane's classic quartet was so different, one must understand the drumming of Elvin Jones and Roy Haynes. Both drummers combined the modern jazz drumming approach developed by Kenny Clark along with the West African drum rhythms. Specifically, these drummers combine the swing beat with an undercurrent of the 12-8 dun dun ba rhythms of Guinea. In terms of mathematic equations, one layer of the dun dun ba rhythm fits three of the eight note triplets from 12-8 time for each quarter note in 4-4 time. So while these drummers are swinging in 4-4 time, they also superimpose increments of the 12-8 triplet rhythms at the same time, but at random points. 
So it's not it's not fixed. It's it's moving around now. We're starting to break up that rhythm. So while you got ting 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 ting, you got to get up and to get as an undercurrent. And so the rhythm is changing drastically from where it was before. It's right in that four four time, and it's kind of staying there. There's some things going on around it, but that swing beat is always there in bebop. Elvin Jones and Roy Haynes' ability to fuse West African drum rhythms with modern jazz drumming allowed the other musicians to bring a freer approach to Coltrane's music, both rhythmically and harmonically. Their rhythmic platforms allow the musicians to play in, off of, and around the swing field and with polyrhythms. Elvin Jones and Roy Haynes became the chief jazz drummers in this style, along with Max Roach. Now, in the tradition of my professor, Bob Moore, I have to mention the different social events that were happening at the time. The harmonic and rhythmic forays performed by these men resulted from hundreds of performances around the world during years of social and political volatility in America and throughout the world. So what we're hearing is complex collective thinking and emotions about four different men while the band is being led by Coltrane. We must examine the domestic and international social events that happened between 1959, the year which Kind of Blue was recorded, and 1965, the year that the last version of Impressions was recorded. We should also consider how the following list of domestic events shifted and reshaped America, altering public thought and daily life. So at the time, desegregation, desegregation of public schools from 1954 to 1963 was happening. Uh, the murder of Emmett Till in 1955, the murder of Medgar Evers in 1963, the assassination of John F. Kennedy in 1963, Civil Rights Act of 1964. So there was a lot of stuff going on socially at the time. And like any true artist, you look at it, check it out, and instead of getting mad, you make music. <laughs> As proof that Coltrane was an artist who observed society and was affected by its positive and negative events, Coltrane's earlier composition, Alabama, is based off the eulogy which Dr. Martin Luther King delivered on behalf of the four young girls that were killed in a bombing of a church in Alabama. These and other events left a lasting impression on Coltrane and eventually inspired him to create solos which screamed, honked, cried, and pleaded to ha humanity for love and peace. The social turmoil of the 1950s and 60s left an impression on Coltrane, eventually prompting him to decide that he wanted his music to be, as he said, a force for good. And I, to me, that is the most uh, inspiring part of uh, Coltrane is that you know, he saw situations that were negative and he made a decision to really bring peace among men and women versus another approach. You know? um, that's very inspiring. Yeah. All right, we're going to move on. OK, at the top left, we have Morton Gould, composer and uh, orchestra conductor. And uh, he composed a song called Pavan, which is a popular hit during that time, in the 1930s. And uh, he was performing around New York City, in Central Park, different places like that, Carnegie Hall. Now, I'm gonna play his composition and just check this out. <laughs> Thank you. 
Sounds good, right? Nice melody. So check this out. So the connector between Morton Gould and Coltrane is really Ahmad Jamal. Because Ahmad Jamal was deeply influenced by classical music. So he, and if you listen to his playing, you can, you can hear the, the, in the lightness of his touch, you can just tell that he really studied and can play it well. So he's listening to different melodies and he hears this melody. Now, Miles Davis is checking out Ahmad Jamal's trio whenever he can. And they're playing So What? So Miles is checking out Ahmad, Ahmad is checking out Morton. And Train is in the band and he's playing the compositions every night. Now the other thing is that sometimes Ahmad Jamal's trio and Miles Davis's band would play double bills. So they're all checking each other's music out. Train hears it. Now the thing is with this melody, you did notice that the theme is stated in a minor key, it's stated in G minor. And then it goes up a minor third to B flat minor. Right, so Train hears that, they're playing So What every night. And he says, you know what, I'm gonna take that melody and play it up a half step where So What goes a half step on the bridge. And so the music moves from Morton to Ahmad to Miles to Train. And so this is the evolution of impressions. And like a scientist, he's just kind of putting it together. Here's something, let me try that. Put this with this, put this with this, put this. Huh, put, oh, now we have impressions. So we gotta thank Morton Gold for creating that melody. <laughs> Cause we wouldn't be playing impressions for 40 minutes on stage, getting, <laughs> getting out all of the, uh, you know, the feeling. This is Ahmad Jamal's version of Pavan. She's moving away from the classical sound, bringing it to jazz. So as you can see, he swung it out a little bit, but he still stayed true to where the theme was, where Morton Gould composed it. It's in G minor, and then it goes up to B flat minor. So the train took it to so what? To me, that's just, that knocked me out when I heard that, this little moment right here, where I heard uh, Pavan in its original form. And just imagining, this is, the, this is something to think about. If anyone has ever lived in New York, you walk around Central Park, they have these huge concerts, you know, all these people come out, they were, they were checking out impressions and they didn't even know it, <laughs> you know, in a retrospective kind of way. So actually, if you think about it, if you went and played impressions in New York for an older uh, crowd, they should know what you're playing. You know, even as, as hip as you want to be, they already know what you're doing because it was a hip. So let's talk about bimodality. In 1961, shortly after So What, recording, the recording of So What, Coltrane records Miles Mode. Now this is the first time he's starting to combine and stack modes on top of each other. And that this is a really a, a revolutionary musical moment because up until this point, it, modality was independent. You know, each mode was independent. You know, you'd have D minor for eight bars or whatever and then you go up a half step like in So What, right? But now he's putting them on top of each other. So instead of red and blue, he puts red and blue on top of each other like that. Then it becomes purple. And the thing is, he's not using chromaticism in terms of the chromatic scale, right? So he's not going 
So there are pieces of C sharp minor uh, Dorian, and there are pieces of D minor Dorian, and it becomes this new sound. Now, the reason why I mentioned Miles Mode is because Train starts to take my the concept of bimodality, and he brings it to impressions. So he starts to solo on the two keys on impressions. So he's in E minor, but he's playing on E minor and F minor at the same time. And then, and then, and that starts to change with McCoy's uh, comping. So now McCoy Tyner is not doing what Bill Evans was doing, which was staying on E minor. Now he's shifting, which you, with each time that Coltrane starts to shift into another mode. So he's going there with him. So this starts to be a new sound that's coming about. I'll let you hear it. You know what? Actually, for time's sake, I'm, we're just going to go right into it. I'm not going to let you hear it. We're going to play. Uh, Miles Mode.
So around this time, he leads over to Impressions. He's experimenting with Eric Dolphy. He's starting to incorporate use of harmonics and multiphonics. Playing When he's playing harmonics, for people who don't know, that means playing more than one note at a time, playing two and sometimes even three notes uh, with the use of overtones at the same time. He's using bimodal concepts, as I spoke about earlier. And then there starts to be a conversation that's going on between him and Elvin Jones. That becomes an integral part of his solos. So there'll be like a conversation happening. We kind of did a little bit, but. Remember how we were doing it in rehearsal? Just do it again. One, two, three, four, four, four. <laughs> Language is starting to change. It's moving away from, you know, straight up beat bop, you know, running heads and, and playing over the solos. Now the drums is becoming a part of the conversation. Two, sometimes three modes are a part of the conversation. The pianist is shifting with where the solos is going. And in the middle of that, he's starting to incorporate giant steps in terms of his number patterns and the shapes of the notes that he's playing. So he's, he's bringing a whole nother a uh, more organized way of playing, which he did on Giant Steps and Countdown, to modality. So now he's mixing. We're going to play uh, Impressions in terms of the 1963 train of thought. We're going for those ideas that we just spoke about. So I, want you, I just want to make sure you guys are hearing where I'm going with this, right? I'm moving away from tonality now. I'm starting to break up the structures. He's coming with me harmonically and he's shifting and these are the reasons why Coltrane's music is what it is and why it sounds so different.
Now, this man right here really changed a lot in terms of uh, modern saxophone playing in New York at this time. This man right here is Albert Eiler. Has anyone ever checked out Albert Eiler's music? It's quite uh, a deviation away from what was happening at the time. He was a free jazz saxophonist, but he was even different from Ornette Coleman. Because Ornette Coleman's music is based as a I guess a, a deviation from bebop. But if you listen to Ornette's first two albums, you can tell he played bebop and he knew how to play chord changes. He just deconstructed things and just was not trying to relate it to form and tonality at all. And the way he developed his music was not based around mode of development. It was just total freedom on the saxophone. He deconstructed melodies. He abandoned form. He created sound, not necessarily melody. In his trio of saxophone, bass, and drums, the role of the instruments would change. The bass player would play like the tenor player, the saxophone player would play like the drummer, and the drummer would play like the bass player on purpose. They purposely were trying to shift sound and shift how we interpret melody and improvisation. And he used the saxophone to, to, to really speak as, as a human cry. So when you hear him or Train when they're playing, they're really like imitating a voice, a yell or a cry of a human being. Now, we're gonna demonstrate one of his compositions, one called Ghost's uh, First Variation. And uh, if you've never heard free jazz before, because there's some people here that I know haven't listened to it, just hold on to your seats. We'll be right back. You can hear where that went. <laughs> One of the things about John Coltrane that is um, impressive to me is how he would constantly check out what other musicians were doing, younger musicians who were coming out with something new that maybe uh, he would not have thought about. 
Um, he did this uh, with Archie Shep, Marion Brown, um, Albert Eiler, Pharaoh Sanders. These were guys who were coming from free jazz. And he somehow managed to incorporate freeness in form, which is unique because um, he never deviated from form when he was playing Impressions, whether it was in 1963 or the recording I'm, I'm referring to now, which is in 1965. Even though it's getting out, as we call it, say, man, this cat's playing out, he was always still in. So it was all organized, it was all thematic, it was very, very programmed in terms of what he was doing. And that uh, is hard to believe in a free context uh, or an almost free context. When you hear it, you might think, oh man, he's just playing out. But he's actually not playing out, he's using out, in, if that makes sense. It's like yelling at somebody within a, with a topic, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's like, you have a theme? <laughs> You keep moving my stuff, <laughs> you know what I mean? You yell in that context. <laughs> so, you know, it wasn't free. It wasn't random, you know, as some people like to believe that it is. It was totally organized. Now we're gonna play Impressions one last time. I'm going to incorporate uh, elements of Ghost into Impressions. Are you still with me? We went from a night in Tunisia, very fixed, to so what, still fixed, but the voicing started to change. Then we go on to impressions by way of Miles mode, starting to use bimodality. Now we're on bimodality, and now we're gonna insert free jazz within this context of form. So there we have it. We've traveled from tonality on the verge of modality to modality to bimodality to freedom with bimodality. 
And that is the end of my presentation on John Coltrane. And I would like to leave you with this little note right here. Change is inevitable in music. It's a quote by John Coltrane. So that is it. Thank you so much for attending. Appreciate it. John Coltrane. Thank you. Let's hear for Daniel Zabo on the piano, <laughs> Lawrence Shaw on the bass, and Connor Malloy on the drums helping me out. I really appreciate these guys. Thank you so much. <laughs>